One of my all-time favorite quotes is from the movie Braveheart, where the main character, William Wallace, he gives a speech to his fellow Scotsmen just before they're about to go into battle with those who were trying to take their land. And the one line that got me was when he emphatically states, they may take away our lives, but they'll never take away our freedom. I love that statement right there. It gets me fired up every time I hear it. For us today, as followers of Jesus Christ, we may never set foot on a physical battlefield like that, one where our very lives are at stake if we lose. However, you may be in a different type of battle right now, one that's holding you spiritually captive, robbing you of your true freedom in Jesus Christ. Or you may know someone right now who's struggling with a particular sin that robs them of the peace and joy that we have in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you're on the mountaintop right now where you've fully embraced your freedom in Christ, I want to give you an ecstatic amen, brother. Regardless of where you're at, my guests and I are going to break down the seven steps of freedom in Christ so you can live victoriously as a child of God and no longer be captive to the lies from the enemy. Now, before we meet our featured guest, I want to tell you about our 27 campaign. The campaign here is to help us reach more men and their families for Jesus Christ. Although the show is free to listen to, there's quite a bit of cost that go into securing each guest, researching each topic, creating the content, interviewing each guest, editing each show, and then distributing every episode and resource in a seamless way and platform for you to listen to and be encouraged by. With that said, I'm asking you for a one-time donation of $27 today so we can meet one of our financial goals of $17,000 by May 27th of this year. We need this to cover our monthly cost of running Men Unplugged and to help us expand our reach even more through our weekly talk show and resources so more men and their families will get the encouragement and wisdom they need to live as a true warrior for Christ. For more information and to donate today, go to menunplugged.net forward slash give or visit the support page at menunplugged.net. All right, you ready to go? Let's do this. Welcome to the Men Unplugged Show. Get ready to plug in and recharge your life, family, and career while igniting your faith in Christ. Now, here's your host and champion of helping men live with passion and purpose, Jeff Jarena. Hey, how you doing today? Jeff Jarena here, and welcome to episode 82 of the Men Unplugged Show, where I chat with top Christian leaders every single week, giving you the biblical wisdom, practical tips, and resources to help you succeed in every aspect of life. Without any further ado, let's meet today's featured guest, Dr. Neil Anderson. Neil, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for asking me. Looking forward to our time together. Well, I really am too. And I tell you what, it is an honor and a blessing that you're here. And so I'm just going to ask you this one question to kickstart this thing. Are you ready to recharge? Boy, I'm always ready to recharge. I keep my batteries charged all the time. Every day in the morning, get up and say, thank you, Lord. I deserve another day and I'm looking forward to it. God bless. Hey, I love that response. And I know that you do that. I mean, you've had what served in ministry for what, 40 plus years or almost 50 years. And so I just want to tell you right now, as you're listening to the show, that Dr. Anderson has served four years in the United States Navy. He's a former seminary professor and the author or co-author of 70 books. And for the last 30 years, he served as the founder and now president emeritus of Freedom in Christ Ministries, which is currently in 70 countries across the globe. So Dr. Anderson, I want to start our conversation here by saying thank you for your service to our country and the help that you and your team have given to so many people, including me. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I mean, that's my life. I just live essentially to see what I can do to help another person find their freedom, find their identity in Christ so they can get on with their life and live the liberated Christ life that really Christ purchased for us. And unfortunately, not too many people are. And I they could, though. I mean, that's my joy. That's my motivation. That's what keeps me going. Mm, that's... Even after all these years of ministry, by the way, because people are sitting out there figuring, hmm, how old is that guy? I said, pretty old. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh, just a shy over 40 years, right? That's about it, right? That's all you tell them? <laughs> now, before we get into talking about how you've helped me and then this master class on living free in Christ, 
You've had a severe life change here recently with the passing of your wife of 52 years, Joanne. So I want to extend my deepest sympathies for your loss. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. I said the last, uh, I've been traveling this world for about 30 years. I mean, all over the world. And my wife said, when is it our time? (laughs) I said, Mm. okay, honey, I'm going to get off the road. That was seven years ago. And uh, we never had our time. She Mm. got dementia and she went on about a seven year slide downward. And last October, she went to be with the Lord. And um, so I've been uh, pretty much committed to do just one thing, and that's to make a life as pleasant as I could. And I wrote a little book about that, by the way, called The Power of Presence. Mm. I mean, I really was really sensed God, you know, wanted me to write something down. I didn't even know if I was going to publish it. But it's about experiencing God's presence during a time like that and what my presence meant to my wife. And so somebody taking care of somebody like Joanne, who's got agitated dementia, Hey, how's it really going, Jeff? Jarena here, and welcome and, uh, to episode 80 of the Mental Plug Show, social. where I chat about with top Christian years. leaders and, uh, every hmm. single week and to give so you the I'm practical tips and resources right that now, you need to succeed as a true man of God. Said, with that said, uh, let's meet God today's featured guest, Jimmy Seitz. As a former pastor, Jimmy has a heart for encouraging and discipling others. With a passion for the great outdoors, He's been the host of the TV show, Spiritual Outdoor Adventures, which is now in its 18th season and has actually won a Nielsen Award. Jimmy, welcome to the show, brother. When you find a good wife, and I found one, and I'm thankful for it. Mm, Amen to that. You mentioned your wife was your first editor, and I tell you what, that's probably the best way to do it because she wants to make sure that whatever you say is going to make sense. So that's really cool that she actually took the time to do that. Now, you mentioned in one of your books, the revised edition of The Bondage Breaker, which I actually got a copy from from your office yesterday, which I'll put a link to on the show notes of this episode. You mentioned in there that you've experienced the peace of God during this time right now in your life in a rather remarkable way. What do you think has helped you with that? All right, Jimmy, before we get into our topic well, today about the decoys uh, of deception and the strategy that we can take like to that. avoid them, I, mean, I wanted to ask you, you what was it that inspired you to start the show in the first place? You know, wish things would change or whatever. I mean, it really causes you to kind of question your own spirituality. But I remember for me, the defining moment was about four years ago. And I was sitting in front of my computer, and, and uh, at that time, we were just going from doctor to doctor trying to figure out what was wrong with her. And no, we didn't get a good diagnosis. Uh, Then I just really heard from God saying, she's not going to live. She's not going to get well. I mean, mean, it was so clear to me at that time, and everything changed after that, is to try to make her as comfortable as I could. And and then while I was driving back and forth three times a day, you know, to see her and and then finally bringing her home because it was costing me $12,000 a month. Wow. skilled nursing. And so the last year she was, I was a sole caregiver for her. And, uh, but it, it happened to me about, about four years ago now, I suppose. And I just suddenly was overwhelmed almost by the sense of, of God and his peace. And I can honestly say that was a peaceful time for me. I mean, I've, I've seen other people take care of their loved ones during that time. And, and I really kind of felt sorry for them. I didn't feel sorry for myself. I mean, mm. to be honest with you, it was it was kind of a special time. I wouldn't change that piece during that time for anything. And um, in a lot of ways, that has continued on. So I, I wrote in the book something I think applies to what we're talking about here today. And uh, I said, I love my wife now more than I've ever loved her in my life. And uh, But not the way I first loved her. When I first met Joanne, I looked across the room and saw a classy lady, and I was attracted to her. It's what she did for me. But now, she couldn't do anything for me. It's like raising a little child that's getting worse. And um, <clears throat> But now I love her, not because of who she is, but thank you, Jesus, I love her because of who I am. And I believe that transition should take place in every believer's life. The goal of our instruction is love. The love of God is not dependent upon the object. God loves us because God is love. It's nature to love us. And that should become more and more a part of our life because we are a partaker of that divine uh, nature. And and, uh, so, you know, I look back at that time and saying, boy, to me, in a lot of ways, 
it just kind of cemented all the years that we had together because she was my partner. I mean, we, we traveled this world together. We went everywhere together. And, uh, and then I went through a little period of time, I suppose, where I'm looking around and saying, hmm, I wonder if there's somebody else when Joanna's gone. And I really came to that conclusion that, no, you know, I'm a single man. I'm a single woman, man. And I'm just going to stay that way. And God can surprise me if he wants to, but I'm sure not looking. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm finding my new normal in life, and I'm going to get back to supporting my ministry, which is around the world, and and uh, being able to travel again. And <clears throat> although I'm not looking forward to that particularly, yeah. <laughs> I got kind of tired of airports. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so it's been a great life, and and it's not over for me yet. And and so I'm just kind of excited in a way as to see what is my next chapter. What can I still do at the age of well, I'll be 77 this summer, but I'm not done, Jeff. Life mm. goes on. Ministry That's right. never ends. That's right. Hey, you talked about the peace that surpasses all understanding in Philippians. That That is big. And hey, don't stop until the Lord takes you home. That's the thing. This is right here. I've talked about, about this on another episode right here on earth. And I know you know this, Neil, but this is not a place of rest. We're supposed to work here. Heaven is a place of rest. So we got to keep working till we get there, working for the kingdom not for ourselves. So for me personally, what's helped me experience peace, and that's what we want to help you guys today, experience peace and really the freedom in Jesus Christ. And what helped me was that one book that you wrote, Victory Over the Darkness, because when I came to know the Lord 18 years ago, a Christian counselor shared the gospel to me, and that's on episode 56, maybe 58. I'll have to look at that. But um, here's what he did. He said, you got to read Victory Over the Darkness. Because I was dealing with body dysmorphic disorder, feeling like I was unworthy, unlovable, had all this shame from all these past sins in my life. And he said, you need to go through that. And so I went through that, Neil, and and it helped me to get that next level to where I could live free in Christ. And, And so again, that's what we're talking about today's show, the seven steps to freedom in Christ, so you can live victoriously as a child of God and no longer be captive to those lies that you buy in from the enemy. So um, on that book, you know how you're supposed to highlight, Neil, like the important parts or the words, right? The sentences. Right. You know how you do that? Well, yeah. I basically highlighted 90% of that book. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's just how much I needed it. So again, just thank you so much for writing that. And and in a way, you were like this invisible confidant, this this coach helping me get to that next step, right? It's really cool. Great. Great. So let's get it going here, Neil. I'm ready to start this masterclass, this counseling session, if you will, on freedom. So I have to ask you here, as we kickstart this masterclass, how did these steps come about in the first place? I was a farm boy, you know, raised on a farm. Thank God for that in Minnesota. And, and uh, I went off to the Navy and was a scene rescue swimmer and got into electronics, became an aerospace engineer. And uh, then I found Christ. <laughs> and I actually worked on the Apollo space program back in the 1960s. We had the guidance system for the lunar lander. I went off into ministry, and, and uh, I had no idea what God was going to do with my life. I, my goals weren't, <laughs> weren't extremely high. I, just, I wouldn't mind being a pastor in a little country church someplace and being fed with tomatoes and chickens and that kind of thing. But, <laughs> Uh, and, and so I look back and I just, what an incredible journey. But I got to a point when I was a senior pastor, when I started to realize that there were people in my church who, did, who had problems I didn't have adequate answers for. Mm. I really believe Christ was the answer. I believe truth would set people free. But in a lot of ways, I didn't see it. I saw people come to Christ, and I saw some change to that. But they seemed to struggle with the same old issues. Where's the new creation in Christ? Where's all that? So when God called me, surprisingly, by the way, in my memoir, Rough Road to Freedom, I talk about this period of of my life very succinctly because I wasn't looking for that. I had no idea I'd ever be a seminary professor. I had no desire, no goal for that. And all of a sudden, I got a call one day, and it was in the midst of kind of a crisis when I didn't know whether my wife was going to live or die. It was really a very difficult time for us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And all of a sudden, the dean calls and says, have you taken a position yet? I said, no. He said, well, don't until we talk. And out of the blue, he offered me a position I kept for 10 years. 
with that burden. There's a, the people have problems. What is the answer? Right. I mean, believe in Christ is, but I, you can't just say, well, Jesus is the answer. Go to him. And um, so during that 10 years, man, I went through a lot of paradigm shifts. I'm an ex-aerospace engineer. I have no interest, no curiosity about the cult. I don't know what my astrological sign is to this day. And suddenly I started to realize that these people were in spiritual bondage. And, um, and my own students were, for that matter. And one thing I've discovered over these years is that one thing that I've discovered with every defeated Christian, every person that's struggling out there, none of them knew who they were in Christ. Right. Nor did they understand what it really meant to be a child of God. Now, why is that? As mean as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. His spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. We're children of God. Why didn't they know that? And uh, during those that time of seminary, <clears throat> I mean, my own scales came off of my own eyes. And mm. I kind of realized one day, I'm in him. I'm in Christ. Why didn't I see this before? I mean, I may have known it theologically, but there was something about you know, a deeper recognition and understanding. And I said, we are children of God. He's my father. And and uh, so I struggled with the sense, well, do you grow into it? It seemed to be kind of my experience, or are we not taught that? Why don't people know this? I mean, it's it's not like it's some side issue. I mean, it is the core issue. Right. Who God is and who we are in Christ. There can't be anything more important than a true knowledge of God and a true knowledge of who you are as a child of God. Everything else is secondary to that, you know, core concept. It's all about our relationship with God and who He is and what, and ourselves being rightly related to Him. And then I, then I had a real paradigm shift of uh, God was starting to send me all these hurting people. I mean, really struggling with all kinds of things. And a lot of them were, were pretty obviously demonic, not knowing really what to do with it at the time. And I would stop and pray. And I would say, uh, Bible says, if you lack wisdom, ask, and God will give it to you. Right. So I stopped, and I would pray, and I said, God, I need a little help here. <laughs> and um, and I would tell the people. I was very honest with them. I said, I don't know the answer. I know God does. If you're willing to wait with me and look, we'll search Scripture, whatever. And so I'd stop and pray. I remember sitting there one time, five, ten minutes. And then I started to think. I'm asking God to tell me so I could tell them. That would make me a medium. And there is no intermediary between God and man. This is a child of God I'm working with. Why don't I have them pray? So hmm. I went home and wrote out simple little petitions, you know, that they could pray. Right. Yeah, essentially, who to forgive, whatever, that kind of thing. And um, kind of reluctantly, I tried it. I said, I'm just going to try this once. And, uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. I was blown away as to what happened. Uh, they would come in and tell me about their dad and how abusive he was and, you know, and whatever. Now, let's say I'm a really good pastor, and I know how to help this person forgive his father, because if he doesn't forgive his father, God himself will turn him over to the tormentors, and they're going to stay in that bondage, you know, to the rest of their life until they finally let it go. And, and I was successful, and he forgave his father. I've done a good thing. You would notice a change. But if he prayed and ask God who he needed to forgive, I'll almost promise you that uh, the first name out of his mouth would be his father. Right. But there's probably another 20. Now, he forgave his father, but not the other 20. How right. much have you helped him? Some, but not as much as you could have. And uh, and the other big one was, was just huge. Was I, I just, everybody, and even to this day, there's two things that are common about everybody that God has brought to us with, I mean, with depression, with anxiety disorder, panic attacks, you name it. <clears throat> they don't know who they are. And number two, almost everyone has had a sex problem. Mm, wow. I mean, almost across the board. And I said, how do we solve this? I mean, you know, uh, abused and, uh, and abusing, and all abusers have been abused themselves almost. And uh, so then I discovered, the, you know, just the truth of Romans chapter 6. And what it means to be in Christ, identified with him in his life, death, and burial, and resurrection. All those things he's done. And he died once for my sin. I don't have to do that. God did that. Now it assumes to my responsibility. Therefore, do not allow sin to reign. That is rule in your mortal body. That you should obey its lust. So, how are you going to do that? Well, uh, don't use your body as an instrument of unrighteousness. Right. But present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your bodies. And I started to think, I said, there's no way that you can commit a sexual sin 
without using your body as an instrument of unrighteousness. Right. So what's happened? You've allowed sin to reign there. How'd you deal with that? Oh, I confessed it. Didn't resolve it, did it? I'll almost tell you right now, it won't. And that's why people get into the sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess, and finally they just give up. And, uh, and I said, what we do in our steps is we'll have them pray and ask the Lord to reveal every sexual use of their body as an instrument of unrighteousness. I mean, you just have to sit there and watch what happens next. God does. usually begins with their first experience. This is especially true for those who have been abused. With that said, I'm just going to go over the steps here real quick. So step one is to renounce or verbally reject anything that you're a part of or said to yourself that was not from God, i.e. negative thoughts, false religions, something like occults, things like that. And a big one for me that I had to overcome when I was depressed for those four years, severely depressed, was I had to overcome those negative statements. You know, that I would tell myself, I'm not good enough. No one will ever love me. I'm ugly. I can't seem to do anything right. So that was a big one for me. And then step two, you talk about to hold on to the truth of Jesus Christ and to live with no deceit, telling the truth at all times and not buying in to those lies from the enemy. And step three, you're talking about choosing forgiveness over bitterness. And then step four, choosing to be submissive to the Lord and to those that have authority over you as opposed to having a life of rebellion. And then step five, you talk about pride versus humility. Step six is living a life of freedom as opposed to one of bondage. So if you could, I'm going to let you just talk a little bit here about step one. Well, when I was sitting, I I mean, I can almost tell you so many years ago now, but I can tell you that day. It was one afternoon I sat out and I said, what are the barriers between me having an intimate relationship with God? What, 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 what are the issues? I'm, now, God has already forgiven me. God has given me, I'm a new creation in Christ. I've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved sons. But the Lord said, repent and believe the gospel. How do I repent? How do I actually deal with these issues? Otherwise, if you're looking at salvation as uh, receiving Christ, you're looking at it as addition. I just added Jesus onto my life. That is so false, I can't believe it. Uh, it's transformation. When you receive Christ into your life, you were transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Right. You are no longer in Adam. You are now in Christ. And the, but to appropriate that, to to experience that in my own personal life, requires genuine repentance. Repentance is a change of mind. Right. The problem is when I first when I first come to Christ, I'm a, I'm this new creation in Christ. But nobody pushed the clear button. Everything that was programmed into my mind in the past is still there. That's why Paul says in Romans, he says, no longer be conformed to this world, because we all were, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so the repentance process is a process of being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now, we need God to do that. We, you can't grow without Christ. I mean, you've got to have life in order to grow, and he is our life. And so I sat down, what are the barriers? Well, if if you look at the totality of Scripture, I said <clears throat> one of the chief issues is is to is to actually do what the early church did when they would literally face the West and say, "I renounce you, Satan, and all your works and all your ways." And then they would make a, a turn and face the East and make a profession of faith in Christ. Now, honestly, if you were raised in a Catholic church or Orthodox church, they're still doing that superficially, unfortunately, but they understand it and they've continued that. And we've kind of left that off in in evangelicalism, sadly so, to our demise, I'm afraid, in so many cases. The the point I'm trying to make is you have to, if you've been made a commitment somehow to Satan or been involved in the occult or any way, that's what we deal with first. Get that out of the way. If you consult them in medium or spiritist, you are to be cut off from your people. And so God does not look favor at false guidance. So if you consulted those things, you made some commitment in that direction, you've got to deal with that. And uh, so that's our first step. And the second step is what ways I've been deceived. <laughs> Man, right. after all these years of taking people through the steps, and there's a, you can be deceived by the world, you can deceive yourself, you can, uh, and we also include in that defense mechanism because that's a form of deception. And, uh, and the average, you know, 
20 year old going through the steps a day will check on almost everything in there. And, and, you know, they're almost shocked themselves when they look at it and they say, my gosh, I had no idea. I think I've checked every one. And, and, you know, that's not an overstatement, by the way. And I say, well, if you actually believe that, people don't always live according to what they profess. They actually live according to what they believe. Right. And, um, and so you're helping them to, you know, get over that kind of deception and saying, what do you believe? What do you really believe about your life, your body, you know, your life, how to live and this kind of thing? And uh, so that's the second one. And then we deal with the biggest issue. There is nothing that will keep people in bondage more than bitterness. Right. You're bound to the past. And so we help them forgive from their heart. Uh, I can't think of one person that I haven't taken through the steps to freedom that hasn't had a list of 10 or more people. Uh, you know, in all honesty, I mean, if we really were living as God intended us to live, there should be none. And uh, and if you if you're bitter towards somebody and haven't forgiven them, you shouldn't take communion next Sunday. They will, and they do. And uh, and for most people, if that's all I did to help them, that probably would have been just about enough. But then we also look at rebellion. By the way, Jeff, do you realize how rebellious a generation we're living in right now? Oh yeah, it's crazy. I mean, rebellion to God, and then you know you talk about also rebelling those that have authority over you. I mean, it, it is it is massive. And, and I wanted to say something here real quick. On step one, I know we're going to get to the other ones here, but on step one, um, another thing that, that, that we miss here is um, we're buying into these thoughts that we're saying, okay, well, I'm not good enough or I'm not um, lovable you know, you're, you're knocking yourself down. And a lot of times that that's the same thing. You're, you're believing some false thing. Um, I know you mentioned that under step one, and that kind of falls under step two as well. But to get into step three, the bitterness and forgiveness, that is a tough one. That is a tough one right there, like you said. So let me ask you this. Before we hit these other three or four, what are some tips that you can offer, Neil, to help the listener forgive someone that's harmed them so they don't have to live with a grudge or even stay bitter towards that individual? Bitterness is like swallowing a pill, hoping the other person will die. The only one we're actually hurting is ourself, unfortunately. I said, but if you're going to forgive us, Christ has forgiven you. How did he do that? He took my sin upon himself. So in a, at the core level of this issue is, is that I, by forgiving that person, I'm agreeing to live with the consequences of their sin. Right. And your first thought is, well, that's not fair. Actually, you're right. But you'll have to anyhow. Everybody is living with the consequences of somebody else's sin. Everybody on this earth who's ever lived after Adam and Eve are living with the consequences of Adam's sin. The only choice we have is to do that in the bondage of bitterness or in the freedom of forgiveness. So this isn't something you do for the other person. This is something you really do for yourself. It's between you and God. Now, let me separate an issue here because it's very important. If you go to church, remember your brother has something against you. Leave your offering, go and be reconciled. That's if you've offended somebody else. And the Holy Spirit brings that knowledge to you. I said, stop your religious activity for a moment. Go over there. Seek that person's forgiven. Make retribution. That's a different subject. Couldn't include the same two person, but that's a different issue. The issue between me and that person who's hurt me, that's an issue between me and God. Don't go to that person. You just may get beat up again. Go to God. <laughs> you know, and... um and, and, and helping people do that over the years, by the way, because you're going to have an awful lot of people say, you know, I want justice. But God says, revenge is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. you got to allow God to, is going to deal with that person. Choose God's freedom. Choose to get on with your life. Walk out of here free. You can do that because I've seen it hundreds and hundreds of times in my office. People come in and the bitterness of bondage and walk out free. It's not a, that is not a process. Healing is. I said, well, I'm going to heal first, then I'll forgive. And he said, no, you forgive, and then you heal. Mm. I can't overstate that, by the way. Right. Say that again. I said, you don't heal first and then forgive. You forgive in order to heal. Right. That is big. Yeah. And then, you know, here's the other thing. You don't necessarily forget what's been done to you or how you've been wronged. But as you forgive, then you start to forget as the years go on. 
It's not an automatic process. So yeah, talk. Let, let me cl let me clarify that for the listeners okay. because it's so important. The Bible says that uh, He will remember our sins no more. He will put them away from us as far as the east is to the west. The word remembrance is the same word we get for amnesia. You just put an elf in and it reverses the meaning. It's actually the same word for, for communion tables. Do this in remembrance of me. What that means there is that what was, was accomplished in Christ in the past, accomplish, apply that to yourself today because you're identified with him in his life, death, burial, and resurrection. Now you reverse that. It says, I will remember your sin no more. What he's saying is, I will not take the past and use it against you. And that is something we have to apply to ourselves as well. If I say to somebody, well, two years ago you did this, you know what I just said? I haven't forgiven you. Right. I'm still throwing the past against you. And so it's very important to realize that. Uh, <clears throat> the other, I think, critical issue is you've got to forgive from your heart. And so if you don't allow God to get down to the emotional core of your life, uh, to the center of your very being, now, this is where God comes in, because when people pray and ask the Lord to reveal to their minds every use, I mean, every person that's abused them in the past, I mean, names will come out that will even surprise them. And they said, why is that name there? I said, you'll, get, you'll know when you get there. And I said, now, very specifically, because it's the crisis of the will, Lord, I forgive him, my dad, whoever, mother. By the way, first two people mentioned, mom and dad, 95% of the time, Wow. It's not that they're the most hideous people in the world, but they are the important ones in their life. And uh, as that name comes there, say, Lord, I forgive him, but it's in the what for that you really get down to the core for beating me and humiliating me and whatever else because it made me feel this way. You, you want to get down there because if you forgive generically, you get generic freedom. And so, you know, it, that's the skill of the counselor to help that person. But you can do that on your own as well. And stay with that till every remembered pain, everything that God brings to your mind, and just let it go. Just give it to God. All right, let's hold that thought right here, Dr. Anderson. We're going to take a quick break here, and I hope that you're being encouraged and equipped by what Neil and I are sharing today. And when we get back, we're going to continue the conversation with more biblical principles, valuable wisdom, and practical tips to help you live free in Christ. Hey, Men Unplugged Faithful, to get the ultimate shield for you and your family, go to menunplugged.net forward slash eyes, that's E-Y-E-S, and use promo code MENUNPLUGGED to get your first month free of Covenant Eyes Internet Accountability Software. And to help us reach our Campaign 27 goal by May 27th of this year, go to menunplugged.net forward slash give, or just visit the support page on our website at menunplugged.net. Net. Your one-time support of $27 will help us cover some of our monthly costs and help us encourage and equip other men through God's Word, as well as the practical tips and resources that my guests and I provide each week. Let's go over them again here because we're about to hit the last three here. So the first one is to renounce anything, meaning like to verbally say against anything that you're a part of or said to yourself that was not from God. Step two is hold on to the truth meaning hold on to Jesus Christ and to live with no deceit, always trying to live a life where you're telling the truth and you're not buying in to those deceptive patterns, those lies that we buy in from Satan. And then step three, choose forgiveness over bitterness. Step four, be submissive to the Lord and to those that have authority over you as opposed to being rebellious. And then we have step five, six, and seven. So Go over step five real quick, Dr. Anderson. Pride. Mm. Step five is pride. <laughs> mm. You know, it's funny. I've taken a lot of pastors through who, you know, good people trying to live a good life. I said, they do quite well, and then they get the pride, and they go, oops. <laughs> yeah. Man, it's, that's it's, a big it's one. It's interesting thing how pride creeps into our life. Yeah. And um, there's, there's no accident, I don't think, that I is in the middle of the word pride. Mm, that's a good point. And, uh, and so anyway, self-sufficiency was my biggest hurdle in life, and I had to get over that in order to be find my sufficiency in Christ. So brokenness is a critical part of our own personal growth. And then six is, is you're really dealing with, with sin issues. I mean, habitual stuff. I mean, people have, have known enough to confess. I said, I just need to say this, however. I said, 
confession is not saying I'm sorry. Confession is saying I did it. And that's right. harder than you think for some people. You know, they will say, well, I'm sorry. You know, what are you sorry for, son? Well, things I did. What would you do, son? Well, forget it. You know, it's hard for them to say, I did it. And uh, confession literally means to agree with God. That's living in moral conformity with God. That's the same thing as walking in the light. It's just agreeing with God. That was wrong. And own up to it and admit it. But that's also uh, step six is where we include the uh, kind of a separate sub subsection of six is dealing with the sexual bonding. And um, not only have we allowed sin to reign in our mortal body, but 1 Corinthians 6 talks about, don't you know your body is the temple of God? Therefore, don't join yourself to a harlot, lest you become one flesh. Right. For you are at one spirit with the Lord. And I said, I can't fully explain that, but I can tell you it does happen. A bonding takes place between you and that person. And uh, have you ever seen uh, a nice young girl in our churches, you know, who uh, is good, and all of a sudden she gets involved with the wrong guy and they have sex? Mm. And she won't leave him? And yeah. parents are scratching their head, frightened to death that they're going to run off and get married or something like that there. Why doesn't she leave him? They're bonded. Right. And I, I have literally seen people that work through that, renounce that sexual experience with that person, submit their bodies to God as a living sacrifice, which were urged by the mercies of God to do, and walk out and look behind and say, I'm never going to see that guy again, or girl, for that matter. And uh, it's kind of amazing. That's in our book, uh, Winning the Battle Within, by the way. We explain that much deeper in terms of uh, the sexual unions that take place. And because it's always was a mystery to me, you know, why in the world do you keep hanging on to that person? And it works both ways, by the way. It's not just women and men and men and women. It works both ways. Right. And the number of, you know, my years of experience, I said, you know, when I first started going public with my ministry, there would be some mother there with two or three kids and, you know, telling me a tough story about, you know, the jerk took off and went off for another woman and whatever else. That's, that has really changed over those years. Now I'm seeing men come up hanging on to two kids, and my wife left me. Oh wow! Another man or woman. wow, and uh, <clears throat> and not only did she leave her husband, she left her kids. Yeah, man, that, that's a whole different level of degradation to me. It's one thing to walk away from a husband you don't like, but to walk away from motherhood. Yeah, mm. or for that matter, fatherhood. Right. I mean, it, it just like I don't care. I said uh, that's depravity. That's what that is. The last step is really interesting because I kind of struggled with it, and um, but I knew it was true. I, I knew that the sins and iniquities are passed on the second, third generation. I, I knew that, uh, you know, and we, we see him as slangs in our thing. He's a chip off the old block. He's a spitting image of the old man. I always wondered what spitting image was, and I realized, <laughs> and I said, but really what it is, he is in the spirit and in the image of his mom or dad etc. And uh, if you want to know what your wife is going to look like 20 years from now, look at her mother. And uh, <clears throat> so we've, we've seen that. You know, my family's just a bunch of horse thieves, and, and uh, everybody seems to get divorced in my family. Everybody seems to be an alcoholic in my family. And, uh, and I have seen that over the years, that uh, the iniquities are passed on. And the good news is you can stop it right now. I mean, you can, it's going to stop right here. How would they stop it right now? Give them well, something break that they curse, essentially, and that's the last step. And uh, and I've had people, you know, question me on that more than anything else. And I said, but I can tell you, and I'm not arguing from experience because in our book, The Sapphire Constant, we explain it, I think, very completely. Uh, I said, but that is the last step. Going through the steps of freedom isn't over until you've completed that last step. And that's been true almost with every person I've dealt with. And so uh, don't overlook that. But sometimes, you know, it isn't that our parents were the most sinful people in the world. But truth of the matter is, we were raised under that environment. Uh, right. And most of that is more caught than actually taught. And mom and dad were racially, you know, prejudiced, for instance, this kind of thing. You probably are, too, unless you do something about it. You'll just continue the same old thing that you were learned and taught, unless you do something about it. You will discipline the children the way you were disciplined unless you do something about it. 
unless you make some change in your life because that's what you were taught. That's what you picked up. Uh, so anytime I've seen somebody that had, had a, has a family that's been involved in a cult or something like that, I'll guarantee you they will need the first and the last step. So what we're talking about here is overcoming these spiritual battles, just, you know, getting to where you can be in a place to where you're experiencing the freedom in Christ. And this is what I've seen for myself is that if you go through these steps, um, these seven steps, then what's going to happen is you'll be able to live free in Christ. And it, and here's the thing. Once you go through them, you're you're good to go for the rest of your life. You're going to have to continue to go back to these steps. This is an ongoing process. It talks about in you mentioned earlier, Romans 12, verse 2 says that we're supposed to be renewing our mind daily through God's Word, not conforming to the pattern of this world. And what's so big here is that we have to understand, I think one of the one of the lies or the deceptions that the enemy that Satan kind of dupes believers is thinking that there really is no spiritual warfare, that there, this stuff really doesn't go on. It says in right. Ephesians six twelve, it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we have to um, be ready. We have to have the spiritual armor on that it talks about in Ephesians 6, and we can't take it off. You know, we don't just put it on for a day and then take it off. We have to be doing this every single day, putting on that spiritual armor. So let me ask you this. What are some lies, some common lies that men and women buy into that holds them back? Well, I always tell people, I said, we're all tempted. And biblically, it isn't the the apple and the tree. It's really the devil that's tempting us. And uh, and he'll use objects that we know. He knows exactly which button to push in us kind of a thing. But the accuser of the brethren, when he accuses the brethren day and night, is a, is a struggle. And, and that's going to end up with thoughts like, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I'm ugly, God doesn't love me, this isn't going to work, you know, that kind of thing. And that is so repetitious for people. But here's the real struggle. If I tempt you, you know it. If I accuse you, you would sense that. If I deceive you, you don't know it. If you knew it, you wouldn't be deceived anymore. Mm. And and there is the battle. And that's why as truth has set you free, that's when you put on their God, you gird your loins with truth. In the high priestly prayer, John 17, Jesus said, I ask not that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. How? Sanctify them in thy word. Thy word is truth. Revelation says he's deceived the whole world. And that's why the whole world lies in the in the power of the evil one, First John chapter 5. It's, it's all deception. It's all a battle for the mind. When we've helped people through the steps to freedom, I'll always have them close their eyes and say, what's it like now in your mind? Is it quiet? Do you feel peaceful? I, I'll tell you, the smile that comes on people's faces is just amazing. Hmm, Many awesome. have never experienced that before. And I said, and, and people also need to realize, I said, why do people you know, drink and take drugs and you know, do those kind of things? I said, because they have no mental peace. Right. And they can drown it out with a little drug or an alcohol or something or, or a driven life, which is very common for people that look righteous. You know, they're driven because they can't stand solitude. They can't be alone. They, they can't sit there by themselves with a quiet mind. I said, there is a peace of God that passes all understanding that guards your heart and your mind. But to accomplish that requires some means to resolve these personal and spiritual conflicts. And that's why we have our steps to freedom. By the way, we just released last year a brand new edition of that. I mean, it's the same process, basically, just written a little bit better. And uh, I released two books just recently, one on fear and one on anger. And we've actually included them as a process. When you teach the class, they can go sequentially. So we're not just giving information, but we're giving you an opportunity for transformation. Right, that's Otherwise, big. you're just going to continue in your anger and continue in your fear unless you actually resolve something. Just right. information alone won't set you free. It requires an encounter with God because the Lord himself is the truth that sets you free. Right. And, you know, once you come to know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, walking out as a born-again believer, um, him leading your life, allowing him to do that, the Holy Spirit resides in you. He transforms you. We don't get transformed by stuff that we do or don't do, not any devices or tools or resources that we use. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. 
on this deal about the seven steps to freedom in Christ, what is something that an individual, if they're stuck in one of these steps, let's say they get to step four and they're stuck, what is something that you tell uh, those that you counsel to get them to the next step? What's some encouraging word, or maybe there's a scripture verse that you share with them? Well, that's why we're not a counseling center. That's why we try to equip churches, because uh, I would say, you know, even if you went through our course, we have the Freedom in Christ Discipleship course, which is what we're using all over the world. It tells you who you are in Christ, what this battle for your mind is, what our position in Christ is, it explains what our emotions are, and what faith is, and how to walk by faith. And then it gives you a chance to go through those steps, through that repentance process. And about 85% could do that if they're set up well, could actually do that on their own, between them and God. But about 15% can't. And so at that stage of the game, uh, go in and see your pastor and say, I need some help. Would you help me get through this? Um, call our office, at, you know, at uh, Freedom in Christ around the world and see if we have, we have many, many people around the country who have been trained who can help folks like this. And so ideally, you know, I would not want to do it in a group. I would want to do a one-on-one session with people. That's right. the deal. And, I, you know, obviously I can't do that. But that's why our ministry is to equip the church. So we have churches in every location who can do that. And we got churches out there who have led hundreds and hundreds of people to freedom. And, Praise uh, the Lord. Yeah. And the beautiful part about that is it, it doesn't require great knowledge of psychology, frankly, even theology for that matter. It requires humble people who are gracious enough to allow God, you know, to really lead them through this kind of a process. And it's not like this is something new. I think it's something we forgot and um, and just overlooked. And the early church didn't. I mean, they took very, very seriously the act of repentance, far more seriously than we do today. And the other thing that was true about the early church that's basically not very true, unfortunately, with evangelicalism, I'm not smashing us here, <laughs> but I just want to bring it out. Eternal life is not something you get when you die. What Adam and Eve lost in the fall was life. That means your soul is in union with God. Physical life means your soul is in union with your... When Adam sinned, he died spiritually, not physically. He lived 900 years. Physical death would be a consequence as well. What did Jesus come to give us? Life. He who has the Son has the life. Paul says, test yourself to see whether or not the Spirit of God is within you, lest you fail the test. This is the bottom line issue. Do you have the life? Is your soul in union with God? And if it is, your body is a temple of God. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so, folks, get that straightened out in your life. Thank God for Good Friday, but what we celebrate on Sunday is the resurrection. Amen. It's the new life. Yeah, that's a good word. That's a great word right there. Part of the gospel is he came to undo the works of Satan. Right. First John 3, 8, read it. That's why it came, is to undo the works of Satan. So you can't leave the spiritual world out of this formula. If you're dealing with a natural person, natural world, then secular psychology works, but it doesn't. Right. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's biblical Christian counseling is the best thing. Now, I, I've been told that there's Christian counseling out there that they're really not doing biblical counseling. It's more like secular counseling. So I, I know well, there's... Well, in secular schools. That's the problem. That's the problem. Yeah, that, that's what I've been told. I'm not a counselor, but that's what I've been told. So two more questions here, and we're going to roll out of here. I want to ask you, how did you come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Well, I was, I was raised in a church, in a Methodist church. I got a little pen, so I've been in Sunday school for nine years, but I didn't come to Christ through that process. And um, <clears throat> I believed it. I believed the story. There's never a time in my life that I can recall I didn't believe in God. Never questioned that. And um, so I got out of the Navy and, and uh, met my wife. She was Catholic. I was Methodist. We compromised, became Episcopalians. <laughs> <laughs> and I was working as an aerospace engineer, and we were invited to attend a lay institute for evangelism by Crew, which was called Campus Crusade for Christ in those days. And, uh, I mean, it was a setup. I mean, <laughs> engineers don't work at night, but I needed some computer time. We had kind of a shortage, and so... This is way back in the 60s, by the way. And uh, so it freed me up to go to this conference. And I was supposed to go to learn to share my faith, but I realized I didn't have any. Mm. And I gave my heart to Christ. 
And I'll never forget the question that would just stump me. If you took Jesus out of your understanding of God, what difference would it make? And I said, yeah, what difference would it make? And now my whole my whole ministry is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, so, you know, Christ that week, you know, just sharing the four spiritual laws with myself, basically. And uh, went out Saturday, talk about shock, led three people to Christ with that little glory. track. And, and that was just mind-boggling to me. I was just like, where have I been? I've played church all these years. Can't believe it. And... Um, it wasn't long after that I got transferred to California, and out of that, God called me into ministry, and and it's been kind of a whirlwind ever since. But I, you know, I thank God for that initial experience in my life of just being confronted with the gospel, of actually coming to a crisis point, and make a decision, make a decision. You know, the one thing that was always true about Billy Graham, and they've done research on it, he always ended with the statement: "You must decide. You have to choose right. the crisis of the will." And so. I said, God, I choose you. I choose to believe. Amen. That day I received Christ into my life, and I've been a new creation in Christ. I'm still working out my salvation, not for it, but working it out, because uh, I'm not there yet. But someday I will be. (laughs) By the way, pass it on to people so they don't get screwed up. I said, salvation is applied to the believer. It's past, present, and future tense. You have been saved. You're being saved. Someday you shall fully be saved from the wrath that is to come. And I think we have to keep that in mind because you would never read you know, anything in the church history where people say, I was saved 30 years ago. It, it just wasn't part of their vocabulary because they understood that. Language has gotten in our way. Now, I believe that God has given me the Holy Spirit, the seal, I pledge on to the day of redemption. But my salvation experience began at the moment I was born again. But it won't be complete until I'm in a resurrected body full in the presence of God. And, uh, and right, I meaning your meaning your salvation obviously will be be ongoing because you'll be with God in heaven for all eternity. Yeah, sure. Yes. And, and so, well, and what you're talking about there is that Ephesians one thirteen that says that the Holy Spirit seals our salvation, meaning that you and I we cannot break it. Mortal beings cannot break it, and God does not break it. So that means that there's nothing you can do. To break that salvation, as long as you have trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, confess with your mouth that He died on the cross, third day rose again, then you have eternal life. Bible says that in Romans ten nine. Um, and I thought what you said there was really cool when you shared your testimony. There was I think you said within a week or two you went out, told others about how God changed your life, shared the gospel, they came to know the Lord. And that right there, that's so much of a big tenet. It's a premise, how I've set my book up, that's coming out probably between now and May of this year. And that is that anybody can share the gospel. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be an evangelist like me. You don't have to do that. You just simply share your story of how Christ radically changed your life, gave you that freedom, that salvation. Here's the key point, though. You have to practice And that's what my book does, as well as my group training and online courses. It's a simple step-by-step guide, taking the guesswork and fear out of sharing the gospel to anyone you come across. So what's the biggest giant, Neil, that you've had to overcome in your life? And what do you want the Men Unplugged community to learn from it? The biggest sin in my life was self-sufficiency. I mean, I... uh... I wouldn't even have seen it as sin. That that is the deceptive part about this whole issue. I, I, I the, the central teaching of all four gospels. I mean, the core is anybody who wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. I'm not talking about self denial. Students and athletes do that. Deny himself, deny himself rule, uh, allowing him to be the Lord of my life. If we think we can fix it and do God's work, he'll let us until we burn out. Mm. And, um, but you get to that point in life, the key to strong long-term ministry is truly is brokenness. And we are constantly being de- delivered over to death in order for the life of Christ be manifested in us. For me, it came about in a dramatic fashion, how God just brought Neil Anderson to the end of his resources so I could discover his. But he had to take almost everything away in my life to get to that point. And I was a seminary professor at the time. 
And I, I look back and say, well, that was a horrible experience. I said, best thing ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the birth of Freedom in Christ Ministries. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think it's one of the most overlooked things in, in Christendom today, uh, that uh, somehow or another, we end up self-sufficient, leaning on our own understanding instead of always acknowledging God. And so my prayer all the time going into any ministry, Lord, I declare my dependency upon you because all temptation is an attempt to get us to live our lives independent of God. Trust in our resources instead of his. Lord, I declare my dependency upon you. I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and guide and direct me through this time, I pray in Jesus' name. That's what I say. My, my staff around the world, they've heard me pray that so many times. I said, because... I have to keep telling myself that. Right. When I sit down with another person, God is here, and there's a role that God and only God can play. And if I try to play it, I'm going to screw it up every time. So get out of the way, Neil. Take my place, God. and But use me. Work through me. And that's what he wants to do, and he'll do it to, with anybody listening if you'll just let him. I can tell you, Neil, that these steps to freedom in Christ, they work. And how do I know that? Because after I came to know Christ as my Lord and Savior, and ultimately that is who sets you free. Okay, but we need some resources sometimes like this to push us, to get us to that extra step. And as I went through these steps and and the freedom in Christ, it helped me to overcome that body dysmorphic disorder, which is a form of OCD where you just, you basically don't think of yourself as worthy. You think of yourself as ugly. So it's like any imperfection on your body, like a scar or whatever, it just manifests itself. And before I came to know the Lord, I was in secular counseling. I was getting antidepressant medications, medications for OCD. And Neil, none of that stuff was working. Came to know the Lord, 180 degrees the other way, didn't need that stuff. And then God said, you know what? I want to take you farther here. I want to get you to really, really understand that your freedom, like it talks about in Galatians 5, 1, that Christ came to set us free for freedom's sake. That's a powerful statement right there, that he set us free for freedom's sake. And you know what? Going through these steps, I can tell you that you can walk free in Christ. Now, there are times that, you know, I struggle with things. There's things that you struggle with, but you just got to go back. You got to continue to go back, reading God's word, praying, asking for forgiveness, confessing your sins, and The Lord will see you through that. He is faithful to see you through that. As we wrap up today's show, Neil, what is the Lord showing you right now? And what's one parting tip of wisdom that you can leave us with? And just so you'll know, I'm going to put the links to the resources that Neil and I spoke about, as well as the link to Freedom in Christ Ministries on the show notes for this episode at menunplugged.net. And to find that, just type 82, that's 82 in the search bar. So I'll go ahead, Neil, and let you answer those two questions. Well, I tell you, right now in my life, I said I have become so attuned to what really true worship is, of of just ascribing to God his divine attributes and living it every day in the presence of God. You know, that really came about with the death of my wife and the long-term process and illness there has, has really, instead of causing me to question or run away from God, has caused me to deepen my relationship with God mm. in, in the sense and to learn to practice his presence keeping in my mind those divine attributes that are always there, that I'm his child and he is my father. Uh, going through something like the Steps to Freedom has an incredible opportunity, by the grace of God, to, to break bondages in our life and, and to set us free from our past. But that's only a beginning. That's, that's not an end. That's a beginning. Right. And, and once I got that piece of Christ that passes on standing guard in my heart, my, once I found that piece, once I know who I am, now you're in a process where God can start to work through you and, and to bear fruit in your life and touch other people's lives. And our ministry will come alongside and help us as, as best as we possibly can. But it, um, I said it never ends. Once you've had the opportunity to sit down with a person in front of you that looks droopy and bound up with all kinds of things and watch God set that captive free. Why did Jesus come to set captives free and bind right. the wounds of the brokenhearted? That's what we do. That's We're just carrying on the work of Jesus. And he's doing that through us, and we're helping carry out a ministry of reconciliation, helping people getting reconciled to God by removing the barriers to the intimacy to him through genuine repentance and faith in God. Nothing complicated here, folks. 
But if you leave God out of it, it doesn't work. Right. Is that your parting tip of wisdom? You got something else you want to share? That's my parting tip. I like it. Hey, hey, right there, that reminds me of a verse, Luke 19, 10. Jesus Christ, he said that he came to save and seek those who are lost, to set the captives free. And I'll tell you what, I'm for eternally grateful for that. Um, Man, my life, I probably wouldn't be here today if I did not know Christ as my Lord and Savior. I can tell you almost certainly that that's probably the case. So, Neil, thank you so much for being on the show today. It was truly an honor and a blessing. Thank you, brother. God bless. As I wrap up today's show, I want to remind you about our 27 campaign. Your support will help us reach one of our financial goals of $17,000 by May 27th of this year. All it takes is a one-time donation of $27. That's going to help us cover our monthly expenses and reach more men through the weekly interviews that I have with top Christian leaders, providing that valuable wisdom and resources that we offer at Men Unplugged. To learn more and help us today, go to menunplugged.net forward slash give or just visit the support page on our website at menunplugged.net. Until next time, stay plugged in and recharged. God bless. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. There's plenty more to see at menunplugged.net, including key resources and ways to engage with Jeff in his training and speaking forums. While there, don't forget to subscribe and receive a free gift. We look forward to you joining us next time here on the Men Unplugged Show. Unplugged.